Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, the idea of these two last, uh, last two hours of our lectures, and then we will be uh, hands-on tutorial, is to uh, uh, see a, a couple of extension of the metadynamics algorithm in parallel, uh, and uh, with a focus on uh, uh, what uh, should we look in our simulation to uh, assess if everything is uh, uh, going well, if my collective variable is good or not, uh, when it, my simulation is done, is converged, so we will try to have a special attention to these uh, more practical uh, things to do that we will uh, put in immediately in, in, uh, in practice in the, in, the, in the afternoon. Okay, so uh, Giovanni explained everything about uh, better dynamics, uh, this uh, free energy method when you add a bias to try to compensate uh, adaptive file, and this is the usual cartoon that, that is used in most of the presentation. There is uh, an alternative version of this uh, picture of feeling uh, uh, well with, uh, with this one. This is an old style uh, movie. But there is uh, an alternative picture of feeling a free energy profile that some of the uh, users of the dynamic used in the past, <laughs> which is still not clear to me. And is put into <laughs> to to fill the uh, to use the shape of water to reconstruct the bath, which which is which is kind of difficult. But sorry, I, guys, I had to say this. It, it was kind of eternal joke. Thank you. So uh, the first application of water uh, dynamics in parallel, and uh, it's called multiple waters, uh, and it's uh, actually it's very recent after the after the introduction of water dynamics. Uh, it, become, it became clear that uh, if you want to fill this uh, free energy profile uh, uh, with sand, you can actually use more than one uh, walker to deposit uh, the sand. And uh, somehow the method can be uh, trivially parallel if you think to, to dispatch several of these uh, uh, replicas of your system that uh, are uh, evolving independently, but they, they, they try together to fill uh, to uh, uh, compensate the underlying energy. So the, you, you can see this as an independent uh, uh, molecular dynamic simulation in uh, which you have a si uh, single uh, unique repository of your bias, and all the works uh, contribute uh, to this bias and then fill each other through the, through the bias and also the others, multiple workers at the deposit. And uh, so in, uh, in this case, the bias potential is very trivially a sum of the bias potential deposited by all the workers. So here is uh, the, the sum of the, all the workers. This is uh, in the case where, where the uh, high reduction is constant and uh, the signal is just uh, a constant uh, parameter or, or depend just on the type of CV. Uh, so if you think about it, it is a very nice uh, parallelization, almost natural parallelization of the method. And also, technically, it's very appealing because you can think uh, of many different ways to achieve this kind of communication, with it, which is uh, not very frequent. So you can think of uh, uh, just trying to update, uh, uh, to, to read the bias deposit from the other workers with not a, a very frequent slide. And this can be done in many several ways, practically, uh, through a message pass passing interface like API. Uh, but this can be easily done by sharing a common file. So we have already, we will see uh, actually in the afternoon how Plume is, uh, is keeping track of the Gaussian deposit. It's just writing a, a list of Gaussian on a, on a single file. And it is sufficient that all these workers just share the same file and read and write on the same, uh, with some care, on the same uh, unit. But uh, this is actually the, the one that has only been used so far. To, to communicate between work. You just write uh, through file. Or you can think of more fancy way of, of uh, depositing in, uh, in the space of this bias and then uh, uh, do multiple work and material calculation from different parts of the world. But this, I don't think nobody ever tried to do this, apart maybe from Jim, to use uh, cloud compute, cloud, uh, yes? Does the population become slower as uh, 
uh, in principle, yes, because what you have to do has nothing to do with the multiple walls in the sense that if you just keep in, uh, in memory a list of Gaussian, you have every time you need that, every time step, you need to, uh, to calculate the contribution of the bias to the forces, so you need to sum over all the, all the, all the Gaussian, and yeah, the exponential is per se kind of a uh, demanding operation, and every time it goes, goes on, you have to uh, some more and more uh, of these exponential. One trick uh, that Giovanni already mentioned is instead of, uh, uh, of storing uh, the list of Gaussian at every time step, uh, just sum over all of these Gaussian, when you, you, you keep track of a, of a multidimensional grid, which is your bias potential, and every time you deposit uh, or you add a Gaussian, you just add this Gaussian of the grid. So at every time step, you already have the sum of Gaussian over your space. So at every time step, what you have to do is just uh, uh, pick the point in the grid that corresponds at your instantaneous position, and you have already the current value of the bias potential. This is uh, one possible implementation that scales, uh, uh, that has uh, make the additional cost of material constant in time. OK, so this is the idea. It's pretty simple. I will go through. Uh, the application in the original paper, and the first thing is a model system. It's just a n-dimensional uh, uh, well, and the dynamics is uh, over time large event dynamics. And what the authors wanted to show is uh, how the accuracy <coughs> in the reconstructed free energy is independent from the number of workers. And so, to do this, they define the first the accuracy. So we have a, a reference uh, exact free energy profile. F of S, and uh, this is uh, at a given time T, uh, uh, the bias potential, so they want to see which is the, this is, oh, sorry, this should be the, the estimate of the free energy from the bias potential, so maybe there is uh, one sign which is not correct. Here, yeah. yes. Because you, you want to compare the estimate, uh, your best estimate of the free energy profile at a given time to the reference. So this is uh, the, the idea of uh, how to define this accuracy, and you want to do it all in all your uh, collective variable space. So you want to measure, on average, which is the difference between something that you know is perfect with your best uh, estimate at that time. So there is a, uh, a quick uh, something that you have to do. So the, the free energy profile is defined, as, as Giovanni told you, exactly on this line through a constant. So if you want to compare to so you want to, com to uh, compare two free energy that are defined uh, with an offset, so you're starting are identical, more or less, uh, but, but they have a different offset, so you have somehow to align this profile before doing a difference, a point, point difference on the CV space, so this uh, is a trick that they do, they align just on the, on the average value of the free energy. Along your profile, you set this to zero, let's say, and then you take the difference. <coughs> so you will find probably in the literature other uh, in the metal analysis literature, in particular, other method to, to evaluate uh, this, this uh, accuracy. Because here you weight basically all the point uh, in the same way. So even low, the low free energy uh, area and the high unlikely uh, area are weighted in the same way. So maybe in which uh, a single point is weighted by the exponential of the free energy. So you say, okay. I don't care too much if the, if the, ne if the never discrepancy is, is in the high free energy region because they are unlikely. You might find also this expression. So this is the accuracy <coughs> as a function of the number of workers in different dimensions of this uh, uh, ideal isotropic well. And this is how it goes uh, as a function of the number of workers. So the accuracy is independent from the number of workers in the model system. And then they did something more realistic. It's not an interpretide. It's a <coughs> complex system in which you have uh, uh, naphthalene in, uh, uh, that you want to extract. Uh, and you want, you want to calculate how the interaction between this naphthalene and uh, the cyclophane. 
in uh, acetylene 3, which is a solvent around which, which is not shown. So this is uh, uh, stabilized by pi pi interaction. So you want to, to, to calculate this free energy difference and uh, between the state uh, attached and detached. Uh, the author uh, obtain a reference to the free energy profile. or the naphthalene or ultrachemical solvent. So these are the two uh, collective variables that they use for a reference uh, of well sampling calculation. This is uh, the best, this is the reference. And then they, they do uh, multiple water metal dynamics in uh, it's a traditional metal dynamics. At that time, the wet temperature metal dynamics wasn't there uh, yet. So standard metal dynamics. Here is uh, that's just the, the, the accuracy of the final estimate uh, as a function of the number of years. And this is uh, pretty constant. Consider that this is not uh, an ideal system and it's, uh, it's, it's not an easy calculation. It's just an average of a ten simulation, this point, uh, and this is what they, what they found. So they have a nice thing that they check in this system, how the efficiency scales uh, with the number of water. So you, you, you can imagine if you dispatch more uh, uh, water on the surface, uh, you want to do it because they can, you can fill the well uh, faster and your reconstruction will converge much faster. So this measure of conversion is, uh, is uh, kind of empirical because it's just the time needed to initialize the system here in this well. So actually it's keeping uh, this, this system very nicely close together. And what they monitor is as a function of the number of water, how fast is the escape from this, uh, from this basin. And this is uh, <coughs> the escape in time, how it goes with the number of workers. So nicely they see that uh, uh, the efficiency scales uh, extremely the number of workers. But it's not a measure of uh, conversion, I would say. It's just a qualitative way of saying how fast is, uh, is uh, escaping from the minima. Okay, I don't have actually a lot about the theory of uh, multiple worker and application. I would, I, I think we can, uh, probably if we have time uh, at the end of a, of a tutorial this afternoon to play with it and see how it goes practically with maybe one, two or three workers because I don't know how many of, of uh, independent jobs we can run on your machines. So this could be, uh, if we have time later in uh, after the basic pay, with the basic parameters of the dynamics, we will have time maybe to do this. So there is a second class of application of the dynamics in parallel that has more to do with the problem of choosing the correct variable and a way to solve this, uh, this problem. So uh, it has already been mentioned uh, a couple of times what is a, a correct variable and what we should expect from a good collective variable for metal dynamics as well as other uh, biasing technique. So if you want to, to, to study and you want to understand the difference in population between two states, the different free energy, the first thing is that your collective variable must, must discriminate between these two states. Otherwise, it makes no sense to represent these two states with this collective variable. So this is uh, the, one of the <coughs> requirements. It's the more uh, collective value you, you add, the, uh, the longer it takes to fill in this n-dimensional free energy profile and also to interpret the result. We have seen yesterday uh, this projection of the n-dimensional, how, how can be difficult to project an n-dimensional space in something that you can just with a, with a look of your eye understand what is going on. We have seen this wonderful sketch up. And so another thing when you and they mention to the active variable, it's kind of uh, difficult to get a uh, uh, quick understanding of what is going on in your system. So this is another reason why you want to be as small as possible. And then one of the most important things is you want to include uh, the uh, difficult degree of freedom of your system, the one that needs time uh, to equilibrate and the one that needs really a boost. These are the slow mode of your process and you want to include that. I want just to say again that these are, these are the requirements uh, for a collective variable to use the metadynamics and to reconstruct a free energy profile. 
If you want something, if you want to reconstruct uh, the natural properties, kinetics of a system, you have to ask more from your uh, collective variable, and this will be explained, uh, I think, more and more in the, in the second part of this uh, workshop. Okay, I want to show first uh, an example of what happens when you forget a slow degrees of freedom, which is something that uh, usually happens. And to do this, we use our Giovanni's beautiful movies. So this is, uh, I think, it's the first time that it is, has been shown, these movies. This is uh, the So uh, this is a dimensional world that is CV1 and CV2. I don't know if it's clear the shape of the potential in the two dimensions. There is a minimum, a very good minimum uh, here, and then a barrier in this uh, direction, and a second minimum here. What we will do, since we, what we will do is pick just one uh, collective variable, CV1, and perform a metadata calculation. Of course, CV1 is not the only slow degrees of freedom of the system. Uh, we have a CV2, we have a barrier in this direction that uh, that is extremely important to go from this state to this state. So we will forget about CV2 and see what happens when you do a metadata calculation. You start adding your bias, potential, zero. This is all the standard metadynamics, so it will go on adding and adding the bias. So now at that point, in the previous movies of Giovanni's, the CV1 going in, in the other. This is the projection of the CV1. So this when you when you integrate out the other dimension. So you see when the basin is since you see that in CD1, the system just stays there and, and go on accumulating accumulating the bias. This happens because uh, the the this uh, this space is, is is well and in front of this space is a huge barrier in CV2 but we cannot cross. Simply cannot cross. So it goes on accumulating bias potential in uh, in uh, in these basins, and if you if you try to estimate, uh, so in this in this situation it never jumped even in this in this state, but imagine that at a certain point it just jumped here and it start accumulating bias potential there, and again when you want to come back to the to the yes sorry guys. Um, uh, certainly, the, yes, absolutely, uh, but you don't know which, which is uh, this, this variable. Uh, you want uh, other to be, to be crossed in the time scale of your simulation, at the same condition that you are simulating. And this is certainly not uh, uh, a fast variable, CD2, in this time scale. So imagine that you want now to calculate a free energy difference between these two states. Since there is this overflowing of the two basins, at least in this direction, you you will have a huge uncertainty of oscillation in the, in your reconstructive free energy because it just stay here also when it's filled this uh, this basin because something yes. Yes, because there is a barrier here. Okay, CV2 must, uh, it's, it's, it's not very clear, but here there is a barrier, and, uh, and then another basin here. When you project this uh, in, uh, in just this direction, what you see is one minimum here and one minimum here. Okay, so this is what you want to calculate. But to do this, the system must jump to calculate this accurately and not see huge oscillation in your estimate. The system, has, when it comes here, thanks to the bias in CV1, it has to happen something that you are not accelerating. So you have to wait really a long time for the system spontaneously to jump the barrier here. At that time, you already deposited so many computational cells that you, are, you have overfilled your basin. And then to compensate this, it will take a long time. You will overfill also this basin because the system takes longer. Wait and hope for CV2 to cross this barrier in the other direction. So again, you will overfill the other part. It's just 
something that is not, uh, that is overfilling both basin with time. And then if you compare, if you calculate the free energy difference from the bias potential, you see a difference that has wide opposition. Is this clear? This is extremely important. So this is the effect of neglecting and using degrees of freedom. And what are, and this is something that might happen when your when your uh, choice is not optimal. So there are two possible ways that we are going to to see in the next slide to to solve or to tackle this problem. One is to combine this method that accelerates a few degrees of freedom with something that we you are already familiar with that somehow try to accelerate moderately all the degrees of freedom. And this is. Uh, <coughs> for example, parallel tempering or retrograde change. Then the second way is try to be a little bit smarter in the definition of your CV and try to, uh, with a small number of CV, to uh, somehow account for better for all the microscopic degrees of freedom. This is something very valid at this point, but we will see more what this means uh, when I will introduce the path corrective variable in the next hour. So you know everything at this point about parallel tempering, right? You don't have any doubt. Okay. So just in three words, two words, you have uh, n replica at different temperature. The hot replica are able to cross enthalpic barriers easily. The cold replica usually get trapped in local minima. So by simulating n replica and allow for exchanges in temperature. You want the cold replica to have a, a chance to escape uh, the local minima. So you want them to go to high temperature and then go back. The exchange is done properly in order for the, uh, for at the end of the day, at each temperature and equilibrium distribution, so a bottom one distribution, in this case, at the proper temperatures. <coughs> OK. Yes. I have That might be, but it's extremely problematic when you have a phase transition because uh, you there the to, to be able to exchange over that uh, regime the, sec the over the peak in the specific heat uh, you you need to be extremely careful. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. When you if you want to access, uh, so if there is a region in your specific heat in which you have a peak, uh, so when there is a transition between the two two regimes. To be able to cross that region in the temperature space or the whatever parameter space it is, uh, you have to be extremely careful because of how the exchange is regulated. So because there, on average, in this region of the temperature, uh, the distance between the, uh, the peak of the potential energy distribution are much far away than over the rest of the simulation, over the rest of the temperature range. So in the first part, uh, Possibly you have a re uh, the, um, the distribution of uh, potential energy are kind of close, then you have a small region in the temperature in which they become very far apart, and then again close. So to, to cross in temperature, you need uh, an overlap between all these uh, potential energy distribution, so you have to be careful as we, in these problematic points. Okay. So this is what parallel tempering is doing, Mo moderately accelerating all the degrees of freedom because the temperature in this case is uh, the thermostat is applied to all your uh, all your system. So from the other side, uh, metrodynamics is really boosting a lot on a small number of degrees of freedom recipes, but you might miss something. So it seems like uh, an ideal combination of the two. And, uh, it's extremely easy to implement uh, uh, the method because all that you have to do is to account for the bias potential of metadynamics when you calculate uh, 
the exchange and um, probability, the probability of exchanging between two replicas. So if you remember how we derive that uh, in, in, the pre in the first lesson, when we derive the, um, the rule for exchanging, for exchanging properly, and it was just a matter of a difference in, uh, in potential energy. Now uh, we have to account for the bias potential. So you have a bias potential acting on the same set of CVs, but different bias potential at all the temperature. So this is what you have to do. And when you try to exchange, you have to calculate this, uh, uh, what Giovanni was, was telling you in, in the previous uh, hour. You have to uh, calculate four terms, which is uh, good, uh, is my, uh, uh, to, to, to evaluate the bias potential of the, of the two replica in the two configurations. So the, all the mixed term and the term, uh, and these are the, the four uh, contribution that we have to add to the. Is this clear? Okay. So this is uh, something that you don't have to care about because it's already implemented in Plume, for example, for Gromax, but it's something that you have to know it's done properly. So in the, in the, exchange, the, in the exchange, this is taken care of. So when the dynamics cross the high barriers in the future activities of freedom, the parallel tempering just takes care somehow no, of all the degrees of freedom, and this uh, should be a nice combination. So I want to, to go through the original paper uh, from Giovanni in 2006, uh, when this method was uh, uh, introduced. <coughs> but first I want to uh, go back to our uh, zeta potential and see what is going on when you do parallel tempering and metadynamics. So now we have two temperatures, so we need a new phase. And uh, this is uh, the curly guys, which is uh, clearly not me, but the, <laughs> the, the other authors of metadynamics, uh, Alessandro. Called replica, and you will see uh, both of them are depositing uh, uh, their own bias potential, and at, at the same time, they will try to exchange configuration. So, in, uh, the good thing is that at this temperature, crossing this barrier is kind of easy. So, these guys can cross this, uh, this barrier with much more ease, and you can see. And at the same time, you, you see here the, the guy is, is going here happily and then you can exchange back to this replica. And if you look at how the bias potential is growing, in this case it's completely different from the previous one. There's no other feeling because the other degrees of freedom can be crossed thanks to the presence of this guy, for which the temperature at uh, CV2 to cross the barrier. So. At the end of the day, if you monitor the free energy difference between these two states at the temperature of interest, you have no other feeling, and the convergence should be uh, much better than, than in the previous uh, movie. Okay, this is the, just to make you understand uh, what's going on. Uh, yes? Uh, I have a question. Sure. Okay. Um, on the so when you have this way, you have this degree of freedom. So you have this overlap between CV1 uh, configuration in the middle. It can be either in the upper CV2 state or lower CV2 state, right? Like you have, you have this red, right? When you see, yeah. I mean, the lower energy configuration. The path looks like red, right? Yes. Uh, and you have an overlap in the middle between uh, configuration in the lower part of the Z and the upper part of the Z. Yes. What I'm asking, aren't you... Um, actually, when you're in the right energy well, you can actually also explore values of the first collective variables that are left of the energy variable like in this bottom part of the Z. So you mean when it's here, it we can go uh, some... Yeah, yes. Part. Doesn't it help you to, uh, over, to overcome energy? You would confuse... Uh, it's, you it's, it's confusing if you, if you look at the project. If you, if you look at the projection, yes, it's confusing in the sense that uh, uh, 
here in, in the same region of, of CV1, you can be in two different places in CV2. Yeah, you, you Absolutely. You will have Gaussians to that part. You will have Gaussians. You will think you added Gaussians to the left hand of you, but actually they belong to the right hand of you. Uh, that's true, but it's the same in, in, in this projection, is the, uh, the same point. The important thing is that you, you are able to to jump between the two basins to have an estimate, a correct estimate of the free energy in the other in the other CV. So you are actually recovering the free energy or if you have a mistake in your estimate of the free energy, I think I don't know, maybe I didn't get it right, but because once you uh, cross the diagonal yes. of the Z, then you have the free of the floor also uh, you know a low value valuable from on the left of C V one. Yes. Sir. These are things that you would actually think about belonging to the right, right energy basin or left energy basin, but you can't understand Gaussian being added to the left energy. This is, well, this is, no, this is, this is uh, if I'm not mistaken, is not a problem uh, unless uh, this guy is not able to, to cross this barrier. Because in any case, uh, the projection of CV1 uh, somehow mixes uh, uh, two basins that are uh, different state. Well, if you if you can look at the old system, so this is just all the degrees of freedom of the system. Okay, and uh, uh, so if you if you and if you project these these uh, two dimensional world in one dimension, naturally there are parts that belong to. In, in points that belong to the other basin. But this is not a problem. It's just, it's just the projection of a two world in, in a one dimensional world. Yes? The problem is not that the free energy mechanism is wrong, that really is not as useful. You, you converge to the correct free energy and define like the integral over CB2. Yeah, uh, then maybe the, the, so the correct objection is that. that this free energy does not mean anything. If yes. the collective value does not distinguish probably between them. Exactly, exactly. Because you have a of the collective value. Yeah. In, in this case, indeed, if you look at the real numbers, so I'm sorry, this, this is probably the first movie I've ever done. So this is. I was not even able to do like Isolang. Uh, oh. It should be done probably in a more clear way. So even if you take into account that mixing, the free energy, for example, the free energy of 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 the it's basically not affected by effect, and there is an overlap in the other state because the energy there is much higher. The energy of the uh, northeast side is much higher than the energy of the southeast side. Okay, so, so when you history is not so negligible, the negligible the effect on, on the difference between the mean. Now, of course, what doesn't mean anything in this problem is Yes. Yeah. The value has no meaning, but the difference between the minima should be more or less equal to the difference between the two yeah, big minima. The two big minima. Okay, Yes. What, in this case, CV1 is better than the structure of the system than CV1. It seems to be better than CV1. No, you would have, you would have the same. Yeah. You, it's a completely symmetric there. No, it's not symmetric. No, there, are, there are barriers here. It's similar to CV1. How good is CV1 and CV2? You cannot use them alone. Ah, yes. Similar in this sense. I think that CV2 is the universe. If I remember the parameters there. You see that there is like a clear barrier here. Yes. Do you still have, at the end of the movie, um, so the, the method you shared earlier today, you, uh, that you mentioned earlier today, you could um, even have to worry about when your simulation was converged. Yes. But for this, like at the end of the movie, when you're looking at the left, it was hard to, you still have to figure out when your simulation is done, right? When yes. If you, don't use, if you don't use the, yeah. this parallel template, yes, you, you still, you, you, you go on observing uh, wide oscillation in your estimate of the free energy. As it's not compensating, it's not getting something smooth. 
Yeah. Because every time he's overfilling here and, and until something happens in the heat and release the field, and then you start uh, overfilling here until something happens in the, in the, in the release of field, and then you, if you plot the difference in free energy between these two bases, it's something that is it just. Is, you do a different answer if you stop here, or like if, if you stop Yeah, the uncertainty is, is, is really high in your estimate. But at least what you, uh, what you have. So could you combine it with the method? That would help in the sense that it, at the at the end of the you would uh, it would take some time, but at the end of the day you would have this oscillation dump, right? Okay, so here we go again, and uh, so the application was on a on a piece of this protein. So this is, if you are developing uh, uh, an unsampling method, first you start with one antipeptide. If it doesn't work, there's really something very wrong with your method. And uh, then you can try with uh, pieces of the protein, it's the GB1. And a popular benchmark is this uh, beta herpin at the C terminal. Uh, it's also poster here on, on this uh, uh, very nice piece of protein. So. It's just 16 residues, but it's enough to make the problem kind of complicated. And it's uh, experimentally it's, uh, alone, it's a fast folder. It's uh, extremely well studied, but we skip this part. So, details of the simulation. Uh, this was done with a kind of uh, but it's still uh, developed and still popular. ORAC, uh, in the implementation of metadynamics, Plume did not exist at that time. And hopefully electrons feel explicit uh, water. And uh, as I told you, when uh, when you put water, you increase the number of uh, degrees of freedom of your system. And this is problematic if you want uh, to do parallel tempering between because you need to uh, more replica to cover the same temperature range. In this case, you you put 64 replicas, and two collective variables have been uh, used on top of two for dynamics on top of parallel tempering. One uh, take into consideration the dimension of the hydrophobic uh, core of this protein, which you cannot see here, but it is in this, in this region, of course. And the other is the number of back on back hydrogen bonds. So these are the CD for metadynamics, but the first test is uh, just uh, a reference parallel tempering calculation. So here, just the effect of temperature on enhancing the sampling of the system. Then I hope you can see first just pay attention here at the time scale of the simulation. And uh, what, uh, what is plotted here is the uh, estimate of the free energy. In this, in this particular case, you just uh, make an histogram and evaluate uh, the, the free energy from this because it's an unbiased uh, uh, simulation. And uh, if you see this in the first, uh, so let's, let's just focus on, on one temperature, for example, this one or this one. In the, it's clear that it, it, in this time scale, this simulation is not yet converged because you have a really different estimate. If you break your simulation in pieces and you look at your, uh, your statistics, it's, it's kind of clear that there's some, something not right yet. And if you put together all the data at the end of uh, your simulation, 8.4 nanosecond, this is what you get. Just have a, just to read to, for the, remind for the, for the next slide, here is more or less the L-shaped free energy potential that we expect from this uh, protein. So it's very, the United state is here, it's very compact, it has five to six uh, uh, background hydrogen bond, then there are compact uh, but without uh, background hydrogen bond structure, and then there are unfolded and kind of uh, extended uh, uh, structure which are less uh, probable. So this is the shape that you have to keep in mind for the next slide. It's clear here with the parallel tempering that still after uh, 0.8 nanosecond, the simulation is not converged. Now we put uh, on top of this schema the dynamics in the two collective variables, this one. And this is what the author found. And if you notice, the time scale here is completely different. So the end point here is 2.8, which is the moment in which the previous simulation was not converged. And if you look uh, at the free energy now from the bias potential, uh, as Giovanni told you, if you look here at the evolution of the estimate, uh, is uh, pretty nice in the sense that you recover almost uh, uh, 
already within one nanosecond, the basic future, and if you evaluate uh, and look at the, uh, at the shape of this uh, free energy as a function of time, it's just uh, uh, growing uh, evenly, as Giovanni was telling me. This is a sign that things are going really well when you calculate differences in, difference in free energy on your relevant states, or you look at the old profile, if you can, and you see the growth of this estimate, uh, the change of this estimate as a function of time, and when you have this nice behavior, it means that there might be something good. It's not enough, and, and we will see an example in the next few slides, but this is something that is very useful to look at. Just you, you look at the temperature you are interested in, for example, and you see how the free energy is evolving with time. This is a nice way to uh, a necessary uh, condition for convergence. Okay, so this is the final uh, result of the author and the characterization of this free energy profile. With this force field, you have a nice folded state, a molten global, and a less probable unfolded region here. Do you have any question of this uh, application? Okay. Okay, then. There are, uh, as, I, as I told you, parallel tempering is a special, uh, is a special uh, uh, method from a wider class, uh, which is called replica exchange methods. And uh, the thing, the, the future of replica exchange method is that you simulate your system uh, with n copies, and you change a little bit the potential energy in each of your uh, simulation. Uh, temperature is, is a special parameter. You can see it at the scale of your potential energy. So, uh, uh, parallel tempering is just a member of this wide uh, class of methods. And uh, there is, a, it has been published a combination of, of a replica exchange method with the renal. And I introduced the replica exchange method already. It's called sort of tempering. If you don't remember what it is, uh, you just uh, rescale uh, the uh, water water interaction in your system and the protein water interaction. You leave untouched the protein. Uh, protein protein interaction of, of your Hamiltonian, and this leads you to the fact that uh, all the terms related to water water interaction disappear from the acceptance uh, uh, probability, and this makes your life easier. You need uh, less replicas to cover the same space. And when you see in a exactly the same uh, similar way, when you add metadynamics on top of this, you have to add the cross terms of the bias potential of the two conformation uh, of the, the conformation of the two replicas. So this is the other piece of uh, GB1, for which it has been uh, benchmarked. is an helix this time. It's actually 21 to 40. And uh, I will skip uh, I will this. It's uh, this time with Gromax. Uh, still, Plum uh, was not there in 2007, but this is like uh, 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 the parent of uh, some a lot of things generated from this project, Glometa, uh, together with other implementation, but this is another story. Uh, in explicit water, the size of the system is very similar to the one that Giovanni studied in the previous slide, but as you can see, to cover, I think, more or less the same temperature space, uh, he needs uh, much fewer replicas, and this is because it's not changing the temperature of all the system, but just changing uh, some pieces of Hamiltonian. And the two collective variables are, uh, again, hydrophobic uh, uh, generation radius and hydrogen bond for the backbone. And same analysis, uh, you want to look at the conversion of your free energy profile as a function of time. Uh, we skip this part uh, because also it's not very clear. And uh, nicely found alpha helical and also beta hairpin structure. And this is with the Gromos force field. Is the result. Okay, I want just to add one thing. So, the uh, the thing that that I would like to point your attention to is here we have looked at the evolution of the estimate of the free energy as a function of time to assess the convergence. We have to be careful because here is a is really a, a, a parallel simulation. You have n replicas, and you should look at all your ensemble of replicas to assess the convergence. I want just to make an example. So imagine you have these two, uh, two replicas. It might be a temperature or other parameter. Let's assume it's temperature. Uh, 
uh, let's consider a protein, so a celebrated protein. So you have your bath with water that contributes a lot uh, to the energy. So, and but what you are interested in is looking at some protein degrees of freedom. So these are free energy in some collective variable like the one that we have seen before. And let's imagine that so you have just two replica. Let's imagine in this case a cold one and a hot one. And let's imagine that you simulate for a kind of short period in which these two uh, guys cannot, uh, uh, at a fixed temperature, has not the time to, to relax, so to visit uh, at, at this temperature the two states. So let's assume that this is impossible. At fixed temperature, you don't have really the time to go to, from the folded to the folded, but, and to the folded to the folded. Okay. But now we want to exchange between these two states. So don't, don't forget that this is part of your system. You have also the water, and this contributes a lot in the acceptance race. So even if this has a different free energy, these balls, that might be uh, possible to exchange configuration between this is just a limited part of your system. So this might happen in the time scale of, uh, of your simulation. Okay? So now what you want to do is calculate, uh, say, okay, I do this calculation and I want to calculate the different free energy as a function of time between these two states, folded and unfolded, and uh, this will be my criteria to say, okay, with this is converged, I stop my simulation and I don't look at anything else. Okay? So I hope this is going to work. So wait a second. So there is another thing that I, another ingredient. Uh, imagine that you initialize your system uh, in a folded state and in a folded state. So one replica is initialized here, one replica somewhere in the folded state. Okay. Sorry, I forgot to do this. Uh, now we have to see this again. Okay, we you know how to calculate the difference. We take an histogram of the two of the population. So as the simulation goes on, this is if you look just at the temperature at the minimum at the uh, cold replica, what you observe since you are able to exchange between the two states, you and uh, you will receive from the hot uh, uh, replica some unfolded configuration, and you will have folded configuration from your uh, uh, cold replica because of any yes. What do you mean? Now this is a collective variable that discriminates between folded and unfolded. Good. That's very good actually. <laughs> So next time I will give you more time and you will solve the problem yourself. Perfect. So now you you are you want to look just at the temperature of interest and you plot the time series of your collective variable and because the exchange is still possible you will see points in the in the state and points in the for this state. So if you measure the free energy difference between these two states, you will uh, probably uh, conclude after a short period of time that this simulation is converged. I'm seeing uh, uh, folded configuration, see unfolded configuration, the free energy is pretty similar. Okay, I solved the configuration. This is a problem because if, if you do something like this, uh, you're probably wrong. And uh, it's easy to verify this because if you do the exactly the same configuration, the same simulation, but you initialize your system in a different uh, state, uh, you uh, uh, different free energy. <laughs> if you both of them are started from the folded state, you will never observe an unfolded state because the transition at the fixed temperature are not allowed in this time scale, and then you would conclude the native state has infinite uh, population and the unfolded state uh, uh, has no population. So the bottom line is this. This is a, uh, is a system of L replicas, and you want to check all, all, all of them and monitor what is going on. And to do this, you have always to understand if uh, the single transition between the state, between state A and B are really going on. So imagine you, so what you have to do to do this is follow in, uh, in time the evolution of a single configuration in his journey in temperature. 
So when you want to sit on a replica, sit on a walker, and go with the walker hot, in a hot hand pedal and going back. And what you need to observe to be sure that, that, that you have convergence is that for this single uh, continuous walker, you experience the transition. So you want to sit on the replica, see it unfolding, and see it refolding. Which means that, that this uh, transition at, at uh, <coughs> which means uh, that uh, two things. Once that it, you have to, uh, since the code see trajectory most of the time uh, at uh, this temperature, we have uh, discontinuous trajectories. Them and repack, re reassemble the trajectory until you have uh, n uh, continuous. This is something that you have to do. So it's a post processing of your all uh, trajectories, not just of the one looking at the one you're interested in. After this analysis, uh, you look at the continuous worker and you want to see the transition that you're interested in. So this is extremely important. And I think uh, it's time for coffee. And uh, after the coffee break, if something is not clear, we will uh, I will go on on this point. Is it, is it clear the, the very last thing that we looked at? If it, this is really, really extremely important when you do parallel tempering replicate exchange calculation. So we can step back for a second if some somebody of you... Uh, yeah. Okay, do you want to go through, through it again? Okay, so the issue is that uh, you want to be sure when you do this kind of simulation that the single, uh, the continuous worker or replica, so you have, uh, uh, how, how does it work? You have two replicas of a system, so if you, that they are exchanging. So if you just look at the uh, cold temperature, you will see a discontinuous uh, uh, trajectory because uh, from the other replica you will get the configuration. Okay? So don't look just as this uh, uh, to assess any convergence, but take your whole bunch of n workers, all uh, discontinuous in the trajectory, and try to reconstruct a co the continuous path. So the, the path that the single configuration is, uh, is doing, the trajectory that the single configuration is doing in temperature. So this in Gromax is, uh, is uh, easy to do. There is a tool called Dema Demux uh, to, to decompose the, the, the trajectory, the, uh, not continuous trajectory, and recompose the, the continuous trajectory. So this is what you want to observe. You want for the continuous walk to experience, to do the transition between the two states that you want to calculate the free energy difference. Otherwise, uh, your estimate of the free energy difference will depend on the initial distribution of Walker. So in this situation, <coughs> we start one uh, replica in the folded state and the other replica in the unfolded state. None of them at a single temperature, because of the length of the simulation or whatever, was able to do the transition. But, but you were able, because this is part of the system, and there is water, there is a buffer, so you can exchange between two things, these two guys. So do you remember that the exchange was a, a difference in energy to exchange? So here uh, you might have different uh, difference here, but this is free energy of a subset of the degrees of freedom. So even if this difference seems high, you are able to exchange because you have more other degrees of freedom, like the water, that is buffering everything. So if this is a potent degrees of freedom, it's almost not counting anything in the acceptance, almost. Everything is dominated by the water. So you might see an exchange between this configuration because of the buffer of the water. So if you, if you think of exchanging these two guys, <coughs> this is what will happen. At low temperature, at a certain point, you got a configuration in the unfolded state. Okay? Now, if you ignore the whole system and just focus your attention on one single temperature, and you plot the time series of this variable, you will see something like this, going happily from folded to unfolded, but not because uh, uh, a real transition of a continuous worker uh, went from folded to unfolded, but just because of initial distribution of a, of a replica. 
Okay, one was unfolding, the other was folded. Here it's exchanging. You you observe green and, and violet, green and violet. So and this for all your simulation. If no if no uh, <coughs> folding to unfolded transition occur in the continuous uh, work. And this leads you this leads you to uh, conclude probably that uh, the different free energy between these two states is converge pretty soon probably and the difference is uh, depending on the in initial distribution of, uh, of, uh, of the workers. If you do the same simulation and you start from unfolded, you just see an unfolded basin. If you start from a folded, you always see a big folded basin, and that's it. So what you have to do is to decompose your uh, 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 discontinuous worker, recompose the continuous trajectory, and observe the transition or start from a completely different distribution of replicas. Actually, I would have to say end, start from a, a, continue, a different distribution of replicas, do it again, and see that you obtain the same thing. Is much clearer? OK. So this is uh, how to analyze uh, what to look uh, when you do a parallel temperature and replica chain simulation. So if I have time, I would like to talk about a little bit Visual temperate ensemble that uh, Michele already took. Yes? I have a question about something earlier. When you had the thing with the Z and the CV1 and CV2. Yes. So, what would be like an example of a case where you might forget a collective variable? Like, what would, like, you think you have all the time scales or whatever, but you're like missing a long time scale one? Uh, can you wait until this afternoon okay. that you will play with an exercise in which you will see exactly what is going on? Okay. We will force you to make a mistake <laughs> <laughs> and to recognize that you made a mistake. Sorry, eh? I'm okay. <laughs> postponing. Okay, so I would like just to, to, to briefly, if I can advance this, we have to wait. Okay. As I already told you a couple of times, there might be some problems with the replica exchange algorithm, especially when you have a, a peak in your specific heat. This is a temperature, but in general, in replica exchange, you change the parameters, so this is a variation of the average of the energy when you change a little bit of the parameter. So this is a, the analogous of a, a specific heat. When you have a peak, it means that there, uh, you need to put uh, many more replicas to obtain a nice uh, diffusion in the temperature or parameter space. Okay, I, I, I prepared this example in the first lesson, but I don't think we went through this. Uh, so if you have a situation like this uh, with a peak, you can uh, see that something is wrong if you look at how, uh, if you look at the uh, excursion of a worker in the temperature. So this is something that usually a program uh, uh, is, is printed in the output of the program. So you pick uh, uh, four of your uh, uh, worker, for example, and you look at which temperature this configuration is, uh, is, uh, is going. So you see there are uh, here two groups of temperature, or two groups of replicas. One is doing pretty well uh, pretty nice diffusion until it arrives at this red line. And from the other side, these replicas are on the other, uh, at the hot temperature, and they are doing a nice diffusion until more or less arrives in this thing. When you see systematically something like this, that your replica is trying to diffuse in temperature, but at a certain point it just go back and go back again, and is not able to, to do the whole trip, that might be something wrong around this temperature which means that in the specific heat of the system at this temperature, there might be a peak. There are many methods to, uh, to solve or alleviate this problem. This is something based on uh, what Giovanni just introduced you, the well temper metadynamics, where the bias potential converges to the free energy, uh, then no, not exactly the free energy, and we have this uh, uh, factor in front. Uh, Giovanni called it as a, uh, wrote it in, as a function of a temperature of the CV. Here is just a, a change of notation, and we write it as a func function of this gamma parameter, but it's exactly the same thing. So if you think of using the potential energy of the system as a collective variable, 
you can write down the bias as a function of the uh, potential energy and this uh, converge for t going to infinity of course at this uh, same relation now you want to calculate the free energy as a function of a variable energy so do you remember the definition of a free energy uh, that we wrote uh, many 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 times so the free energy is a function of variable s just an integral over all the configurational space then you have to pick all the configuration which has this value of the collective variable so this is the delta function and you have to weight each one with the potential energy of the system modulo anormalization or whatever so this is the definition of free energy if you just plug here uh, u what you obtain it's easy to see so it, it's uh, um, if s is u sorry if uh, s of r is u of r so here what you obtain is how this is right f of u is equal to the integral in dr of delta s u minus u of r so all the configuration that, that has the value of the energy equal to u so this is the depth oh, sorry. this is basically the density of state of the, the number of state that has uh, the value of the energy equal to u so this is the definition of free energy so sorry this is wrong because this is a probability this is a probability so this is the probability that uh, the variable has this value and the free energy is just the logarithm of the probability so if you take uh, the logarithm of this expression what you obtain is uh, the potential energy and then uh, the logarithm of the density of state of the number of state so this is just <coughs> how it goes with the energy as collective variable so at the end your system is potential energy at the end of the simulation of the system of the original potential energies plus the bias potential at the end of the simulation so when this is almost correct so this is the potential energy in the limit of what we call a well-tempered ensemble so you can rewrite uh, given this definition the partition function of, of this system in terms of the potential uh, energy distribution in the canonical ensemble so this is the a partition function of this ensemble that we call well-tempered as a function of, uh, of course is, a, is this function of the potential energy you substitute uh, this relation here and what you obtain is this uh, the change of notation this, uh, this uh, relation so if you think about it uh, and you think as a, a distribution of energy as more or less Gaussian centered around a certain value with certain fluctuation If you take the gamma root of this potential energy, so what you obtain is something, you put just a gamma here, more or less, and what you obtain is a distribution that is centered in the same uh, value of the average energy, it is centered in the same value of the energy, but has fluctuation that are enhanced by this factor gamma. So this is, uh, this is what we define well-tempered ensemble, and uh, with the uh, potential energy, canonical potential energy distribution like this, the result is that we have an ensemble in which we have the same average energy of the canonical ensemble, but enhanced fluctuation by factor of gamma. And as Giovanni told you, it's nice to have this parameter because you can switch from the normal, in, in his case, from a normal metadynamics to a normal sampling, which is equivalent to say, we switch from a uh, canonical ensemble to an ensemble in which the potential energy distribution is flat. It's, it's just a recasting of this uh, idea that there are two limits. Uh, now the parameter is gamma, but there is a normal sampling and a sampling on a flat uh, landscape, uh, which is uh, so-called multi-canonical ensemble. Are there any question on the definition of uh, this ensemble? Okay. So. Uh, we already discussed the multiple times that 
uh, the things that regulate the acceptance is the overlap between potential energy distribution in parallel temperature and electrical exchange. So it seems, uh, seemed natural to us to couple the two things. So we, we want to a little bit enhance this fluctuation uh, to achieve a better acceptance rate. And if you work out in this ensemble, the acceptance as a, in terms of the old energy uh, which now has a wider fluctuation of the same form, but with a reduction of this gamma factor. So this is uh, the relation of acceptance in the, in the, in the limit of a well-tempered ensemble. Okay, so this is, uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time because uh, I have uh, also another part uh, on tackling the collective variable problem, which is a path collective variable that I would like to talk about. But this is basically what is going on. Uh, it's uh, a normal metadynamics calculation, well-tempered metadynamics calculation, uh, in a special, at least for these purposes, collective variable, which is the energy, which leads to an increased fluctuation, and tunable fluctuation of a potential energy. This has been combined with parallel tempering to enhance the exchange rate and accelerate the round trip time, so the time needed to go to high temperature and go back to, to, to low temperature, which is one of the criteria that is commonly used to judge how good, how uh, efficient is your parallel tempering. Not sure it's the best, but it's one of the, uh, always the best, but it's one of the most used in many occasions. So, uh, Jim also showed another thing uh, yesterday, a couple of days ago. So this is just a metadynamics in the potential energy. Uh, once you do this, or on top of this, you can think of biasing also other degrees of freedom. Uh, like if you're studying, uh, as Jim did, uh, a protein in explicit solvent, you can think of combining protein degrees of freedom and bias protein degrees of freedom along with the potential energy. So it's not exactly a long in the sense that it's a two-step process, uh, the one that Jim uh, performed. So first, you create, you obtain this well-tempered ensemble by enlarging the fluctuation, and this leads you to a bias potential. This bias potential in this application is uh, uh, held fixed during the simulation. And to this uh, potential energy function plus bias potential, which gives you the well-tempered ensemble, Jim performs another metadynamics calculation. So you have <coughs> the effect of a well-tempered ensemble to exchange uh, more efficiently your, syst your solvated system in, in parallel tempering. Plus, you have a metadynamics in the protein degrees of freedom, as the example we showed in the previous uh, lecture, to enhance uh, protein uh, uh, conformational search and uh, to enhance possibly a folding to folding transition and to converge a protein uh, related uh, free energy surface. So, this is a, a two step process. Is, is, is this clear now what, what uh, this was about? So it's a, we, we, we saw the things in different moments. So there is a parallel tempering plus metadynamics uh, in protein degrees of freedom, the example of the Erpin, uh, of Giovanni and others. Uh, we have seen the well-tempered ensemble as a way of enhanced fluctuation. You can simply combine everything, these two metadynamics calculation in different variables, and do what Gene did on this small protein. And hopefully now it's also more clear, uh, oh, it's not here in this slide, <coughs> why Jim was talking about folding time of this protein, uh, which was of the order, I don't remember, if 10 or 10 nanosecond, 15 nanosecond. And uh, the thing is that uh, this is the folding time of a continuous walker that are going at high temperature and going down. So it's something in an unphysical situation where the temperature changes. But it's a, it was a way to say, okay, I observed my continuous walker folding and refolding, and this is the time. So I'm sure that I'm monitoring a free energy difference, and it's going pretty well, and I observe in folding and refolding events. So I'm sure that at least I, I did my best to assess the conversion of the simulation. So it, is this uh, clear? OK. So this is, uh, as I introduced, I introduced this as a way to uh, 
take care of the degrees of freedom that are not biased by metadynamics, all this combination of, with parallel methods. Now, ooh, I have to change presentation. There is uh, another way, which is, uh, as I told you, to be a little bit smarter, or to think of a collective variable that can take care of the complexity of your problem, of the transition between two, two states in a better way, so that you don't, you are, it's less likely that you forget something slow. And these are the so-called path collective variable. <coughs> so, the idea of a path collective variable is uh, not to represent or, uh, configuration, a microscopic configuration in terms of uh, just a uh, uh, I don't know, the number of hydrogen bond or some filter specific of this single configuration, but to map, to describe this configuration in terms of other configurations. So you want to describe uh, uh, a microscopic configuration in terms of uh, a path going from your uh, state A, that you're interested to study, to a state B, that is your other uh, state that you want to calculate uh, the free energy difference. So you have n points, a state A, state B. You want a free energy difference uh, uh, between these two states. And what you do is you, def you define a path from going to A to B. We will see in the example how. And you map a configuration based on this reference path. So this is the idea. And to map the configuration with respect to a path, you use two variables. These two vari variables come in pair. So you have to use both, uh, probably. So one is the progress along the path. And this is a measure of your configuration, If I, which is, uh, let's say, the closest point of the path, which is the point of the path for which I am closest. So it's just the projection of myself along this path, which is the progress of this current configuration with respect to the path. Uh, this test, which is the closest configuration of the path, but there's nothing about the distance of the microscopic configuration from the path. So you can be very, very, very far away from the path, but this is the closest point uh, to you. So you used to use this progress together with a distance from the path. The progress is defined in this way. <coughs> so variable S is defined in terms of a reference path, which we call S of L. So here there are two S. I hope it's not uh, uh, misleading. So this is, uh, you can think of this as the whole uh, set of coordinates of a system. So this is a frame of your path, the full set of coordinates of a, of, a, of a frame of your path. And here is a full set of coordinates of a microscopic configuration. And this is the distance, for example, the RMSD between your configuration and one frame of the path. Okay. This is a prefactor that we will uh, explain uh, later. And this is basically is an average of this quantity, which is the index on the path, uh, weighted by this weight. So what's the effect of this guy? If I'm, I am the microscopic configuration, and I'm extremely close to frame one of my path. Okay? So this distance is extremely small, almost zero. So what you obtain is uh, here, while the other are, I'm very far from all the other frames, so basically in this sum, you just survive the term that, that is the distance of the closest frame, sort of like this. So here, you will have just one element of the sum if I'm ex sitting on top of, a, of one frame. And this is a normalization. So basically, this S gives you zero. If you sit on uh, the last frame of, of the path, this, this uh, this variable gives you one. So here is just uh, uh, here are the frame of the path, these black dots, and here is just the uh, set of points at fixed values of s. So you see the uh, region of points with a fixed value of s. The other variable, which is uh, uh, formally very similar in the sense that you always have this sum of weighted sum. Uh, when you have this matrix here, is the distance from the path. So you can see here, as a function of uh, your points, uh, what has the uh, ensemble of points with a given value of z. So this is very close, and then you got very far. OK, so as I told you, uh, this uh, 
I, I told you, imagine like the whole set uh, of microscopic of, of uh, Cartesian coordinates. It can be something else. Uh, so you can uh, represent uh, uh, your system in other ways. Think of a collective variable again. So you can think instead of giving the full coordinates, give a, a contact map or given other measure of a, of a structure. And when you do this, uh, you have to define also a matrix. So if I define uh, that my I want to represent my configuration, microscopic configuration with a contact map, I have also to define uh, the distance, the difference between two configurations, so the distance between two contact maps. Okay? So it comes always, you define the, the, the way to represent your system and you define a matrix in this space. So this is what is this S. And this I will tell you in a second, and this is just the number of frames. So this is what you have to define. You have to define a state A, a state B. You have to rep yes. So S goes to zero to one is B bounded in any way? Uh, uh, no. Nope. Is is it bounded? It's exactly on the path. Is it, or is it Sorry, can you say it again? If it's like exactly on the path of the limit or something, I think it's closer. Is uh, just one is if you have just one frame, uh, actually it can be is is not bounded to zero. It can be also a little bit negative, and. Uh, uh, I don't know if we have an example of this in. Uh, but there is this minimum value is minus one over lambda times logarithm of the number of frames. So I mean, I think that this is the way that it's been implemented traditionally. But you can just shift it. Let's say you divide times. Uh, if you don't like this, you just divide times n. Ah, uh, sure. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But, but also, it, 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 so it is in principle, but in fact, it is not possible because it cannot be like a distance equal to zero from all the frames. Unless we are, you define a path with just sit, all the frames sitting on top of each other. Which so is usually the fact that it can become negative is considered as, as a signature of the fact that lambda is not, is not chosen properly and you are mixing too many states in the same time. And we, we have an example, I have an example in the, in the next slide of what the effect of this lambda on the choice of this lambda. Okay, so you, you have to choose uh, uh, the representation or collective variable again for these uh, states, uh, Cartesian coordinates, contact map, uh, and uh, an appropriate matrix. Uh, and then you, have, you, have, you need uh, um, a reference path, so an initial guess of a, of a uh, reaction pathway or a set of frames between, in between A and B. This is your first guess. And then you have two variables defined, the progress. So in this case, if the configuration is here, this is the value uh, more or less of S, these frames. And then the other variable is the distance. For example. So the, the, the bottom line is that uh, these are my two variables. I want, I'm, and the initial guess of the past might be good or might be bad. The idea is, okay, let's use metadynamics on this variable and try to push the system away from this uh, initial path and trying to find, to find the real uh, or the most likely path to go from A to B. So if uh, you have a, already a perfect uh, uh, guess from the initial pathway, what you would observe in a free energy landscape is that there is a nice uh, uh, there is a nice minima or set of minima that lies at very close z. So z equal to zero means I own my reference path. If this is a good approximation of what is going on, then you will have in the free energy landscape as z a nice uh, valley there. So this is hopefully I, I, I will show you this with Alan and Dipeptide. I don't have to spend time on this. So phi psi. And uh, I don't remember the exact definition of the reference path, but this is, this is the position of the frames. 
So you define this reference path, you do metadynamics, and then you look at the free energy landscape in these two variables. And this is looked like this, which is different, of course, from the usual Ramachandran plot. plot. This is a, uh, another projection. And uh, as you see, there is a nice path uh, with a transition state here that is lying close to the reference path. So there's some, which means that the, my initial guess is not that bad. That is not the only thing that is going on here. You observe other way of uh, uh, connecting the two points, uh, 0 and 1, in this landscape. So this is uh, the example in the original paper from uh, Davide Branduardi, Francesco Gervasio and Michele Parinello. And uh, if you map this in the usual Ramachandran plot, uh, you can see that uh, these are a uh, reasonable way to connect the two points, uh, which are uh, these two states. So since there is periodicity, you can think of going in different direction to connect these two points. So these are uh, very clear here, let's say, how to go from these two points. The projection gives rise to this uh, free energy landscape. What is this again? This is uh, a progress variable along this initial guess of the transition between uh, state A and B. So state A is here, state B is here in the Ramachandra plot. Okay? So you have a guess. I don't remember if, uh, yes, it's a linear interpolation. You can see this in the dihedral space. And what is uh, Z? Z tells how far I am from the path, okay. from the reference path. Okay? So imagine if you if you pick, uh, if you do a second iteration of this, uh, of this algorithm and you use as reference path something close to this yellow line and you do it again, what you observe is this nice valley to get uh, down as z to zero. It means that you have improved your choice of, uh, of the reference path because you had some prior knowledge. Same thing, you can say, okay, there might be something here, let's try to sit now on this, on this reference path, and what you would obtain is a different projection that in, in which the system likes to stay at z equal to zero. So this is uh, uh, the, the first application. I want just to show you the effect of choosing lambda. So lambda is something that uh, is uh, commensurate it should be other, uh, related to the distance between frames because it's just a prefactor here of exponential. Uh, let's see uh, in a simple monodimensional case, uh, so you have just x and four frames, uh, what happens when you have a high lambda or a low lambda? So when you have a li high lambda, you have a value of s, if you think of, of moving the system along, this, uh, along x, which is the only degrees of freedom, that jumps uh, from discrete value of 0 and 1. So it's uh, uh, this lambda, because uh, being high, becomes very selective, let's say, and when you are more close to this, it just gives a value of uh, zero, or uh, the, the index of the frame. When you get closer to this, it just gives you immediately the value, select immediately this frame as, uh, as the one, and so you have this nice uh, step-like uh, uh, behavior. If you think of very, very, very low lambda, here the dependence from the from the frames uh, becomes weaker and weaker, and this is what you obtain, so something really bad. If you think of metadynamics, in metadynamics you want to put a bias on this variable to push it away, to move it. Okay. Uh, as long as the CV remains constant when you move the system, okay, the derivative of this CV with respect to the, to the position is zero. Okay? So you're putting bias, but the system is not doing anything. Instead, you want to guide the transition along the path. So you want the force to be there to move your system. So something like this, or something like this, is not what you want to observe. Is this, is this, uh, is this clear? Otherwise, I can spend a couple more seconds. Okay, what you want is something that smoothly changes, a lambda that shows in such a way that uh, you go smoothly in S from 0 to 1 when you move your system closer to the frames. So this is what you want to achieve. And how to achieve this? <coughs> so this depends again on this quantity. This is the distance between the nearest frame. So think of a Gaussian. Here there is an overlap between frames. If 
these Gaussian are completely separated, then it's extremely difficult to, to move slowly from one frame to the other. You would observe something like the, the picture on the left, a step like uh, a behavior. And this is not what you want because you want forces to, to drag the system. Uh, so a simple recipe is to enforce some overlap between uh, all uh, these uh, uh, Gaussian, between a decent frames. And this is a simple recipe to choose something uh, proportional to the average distance between frames. Okay? So you pick your initial path, you calculate uh, the average di distance between frame uh, i and i plus 1, and you use uh, this formula, which should give you an overlap of the tail of the next frame with respect to the uh, Gaussian of the previous frame. This ensures that I'm moving away uh, smoothly from one frame, I already feel uh, in this uh, exponential the presence of the other frame, and uh, I have force to go to the other, uh, to the next uh, uh, milestone of my path. Is this more or less clear? Okay. So, the problem is, uh, is this one. You want uh, to calculate an average distance. So you want the distance to be as uniform as possible. So, that this behavior, if it is not uniform, you calculate an average, so this lambda would be kind of good for some frames. For other frames, you will have a behavior like this. Maybe the behavior is not like this all along your path, but there are regions for which lambda is not good, because the distance of these frames is very different from the, from the average, and then you would have some of this behavior in portion of your paths. So you, this is a, kind of representation of the distance between uh, a decent frames. Uh, so just look at this part. Uh, it's not maybe the best way to do it, but sorry, it was the uh, quickest way to do it for me. And uh, if you look uh, just at this part, uh, and you look at the high of these triangles, uh, this is the distance between a decent frames. Uh, so you want these heights to be the same, these white uh, triangles. Can you see that? So this is kind of bad for also other reason, but let's just uh, think about uh, the average distance between the decent frames. So you want to change the definition of the frames in order for this distance to be more uniform across your old path, in order for the average to be something good for each single transition. OK, so this is the, the basis of the basics of the choice of a parameter for the path. So you have to have an initial trajectory. It can be uh, uh, from previous simulations. It can be an interpolation from two frames. It can be whatever your uh, imagination uh, can produce. And then you have to calculate uh, a distance. We choose a representation, Cartesian coordinates, RMSD, and we will see a couple in the next few slides. And then ensure that your frames are well uh, distributed in this, uh, in this matrix. Otherwise, you have to, to change the definition of your paths, and there are methods to optimize the path. But I don't go in these details in this presentation. So instead, I want to show you an application uh, beside the first one. And uh, uh, at variance with the previous application, I would like to not just to show the results, but uh, uh, to go through all the steps of the process, like uh, an historic view of this work, uh, to see all the mistakes that I did uh, to do this work, uh, and uh, how it, in the end uh, we managed to publish something. So it's always the better helping, and uh, so you know everything about the, the system. We use NAMD for this, not Chromax, uh, and with uh, homemade metadynamics, which is something that went into Plume the, at a later stage. And this is standard metadynamics, not well-tempered, but it's very, very, very gentle. It's just 0.1 k cal per mole per picosecond. OK, so initial path. I show you the work of Giovanni in the few slides ago. So we know already everything about this system. Let's cheat a little bit and try to uh, find something uh, reasonable to go from folded to unfolded state. This was the idea. So here is his uh, uh, beautiful picture. Here is, the uh, again, the number of hydrogen bond versus radius of generation. So we picked, uh, sorry, it's not very clear, but we picked uh, some uh, good configuration
configuration in this region of, uh, of a free energy surface along the L. Yes? Are you not using the number of hydrogen bonds? Okay. These uh, hydrogen bonds are calculated through a switching function because in, it's the one that you use for metadynamics. So it's something that smoothly goes from 0 to 1 as a function of the distance. So it's, uh, it's 1 or minus, to the remember, R uh, divided by a 0 to a certain power, divided by 1 over R minus a 0 to another power. And this goes, uh, goes smoothly from with the distance from 1 to 0. This is maybe not the best choice for, uh, or, uh, for the switching function, but the one that we are used to use, and we have a lot of uh, 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 expertise with choosing these parameters uh, to obtain a certain behavior in a certain range. No, the dis we have different R0 depending on the problem. So an hydrogen bond is a contact that goes to zero in, I don't know, two and strong, depends on the, your kind of uh, sensibility. A C alpha contact goes down <laughs> eight and strong or something like this, seven and strong or something like this. But once you choose a cutoff, or, uh, it's not a cutoff, you choose your R0 parameter and the, and the other exponent, you have to fix the same thing for all the pairs. You, you, you don't change usually. You don't do different parameters for different hydrogen bonds. So this uh, gives rise to a non-integer value, but a continuous uh, a function and you can derivate even in the R equal to R0. Okay, so this is uh, how we pick uh, the frames. So it's something that goes from the native uh, where all the bonds are formed for this is open in this direction, like a zipping, and this is uh, more uh, unfolded. Okay, so this is the initial representation. This is the initial choice of a path. Now, how do we represent this? We are not representing it with a Cartesian coordinate, but we chose a representation in terms of contacts. Uh, uh, the reason is that uh, uh, there was a desire to experiment different metrics uh, besides the RNP of the first article. And for some problem, it's, it seemed to me at least more natural. You also see yesterday in the sketch map idea that uh, how uh, the idea is to, to map the distance in the, to have a dimensional reduction in which you preserve the distances between the point in the two spaces, but uh, you don't really care about things that are too close, maybe two atoms are too close, you don't care because maybe you're just putting the noise of all the chemical uh, bonds and all these parts, so you have a lower cutoff, I don't care about this too close part, and at the same moment you don't care about things that are really far away. So this was the idea of, uh, behind the sketch map. It's, it's a dimensional reduction based on preserving distances, but in a certain range, uh, which is interesting. Similarly, uh, it, it, it seems natural to me to consider distances between two structures by discarding things that are really far away that might be different, and I don't want to consider them different, uh, while I want to focus the difference between structures in a certain range of distances. So this is uh, uh, why we probably uh, a posteriori why we chose uh, these, uh, these metrics. So basically you convert through the uh, similar switching function, here is just C alpha, your uh, configuration into a map. So here are the map of the ten, the 10 frames, some of these 10 frames. And then, given this, we start our simulation. So this was the first run that I submitted. And what we see here is S from 0 to 1 and Z. Okay, I want just to point out something. So when S is equal to zero and Z is equal to zero, I'm sitting on the first frame. I am in the folded region. Okay, and uh, here just to make it clearer, I'm plotting the RMSD with res of the old protein uh, with respect uh, to the native state. So there is a long part of the simulation, 100 uh, nanosecond in which uh, this is uh, actually exploring the S and Z space, at least part of it, and uh, 
uh, going back, even refolding. So we define a, a refolding event uh, when these red lines occur. So here it's going from MSD very low to, I don't know, 8, 7, something like this, and then go back to folding. And we were very happy because until 100 nanoseconds, we had some reversible folding, unfolding to a certain extent, and refolding. After a certain point, as you can see, the RMSD just remained very high. So it was just stay unfolded. No more refolding events. And if you look at S or Z, it's trying to go back to zero here, but it's just finding like a wall. I'm going down, but I'm not going down to zero. I'm, I'm, I'm going back and, and finding a wall. So previously, at the same point of the CV space, I was going down actually at the, in the folded state. But at a certain point, I'm going back, and I find here like a barrier, and I, I, I'm not able anymore to, to reach the folded state. So this is a sign that something is going on. This point here, let's say, when it's refolding, and in this region when it's trying to refold in, from a microscopic point of view, they are maybe the same from the, in this projection, but from a microscopic point of view are completely different, or different enough that the first is able to fold, the second, which has the same number, value of the CV, is not folding anymore. So there's something missing in our description that is crucial to, to obtain reversible folding and refolding. So, as you can imagine, we spent a lot of time in un trying to understand what was going on. And uh, uh, as Michele told you, uh, finding in the end the right collective variable is solving the problem. It means that you have under understood uh, what is the f physics and chemistry of your problem and what is the relevant figures of freedom, and then you are done. Uh, so we, we explore a lot and look at the system, and something became more clear when we look at a little piece of the Erpin, so it's uh, really the loop of the Erpin. And in the first part, when we observe uh, a lot of uh, transition between what we thought was the unfolded state, actually the RMSD of the turn with respect to Venati remained very close. So the, the loop of this protein was almost always folded. We were able to break all the hydrogen bond of the backbone, but the, uh, the turn remained folded until something happened here, and that destroyed completely the, <coughs> the, the loop. At that point, uh, our CV, in this time scale, were unable to refold it anymore. OK. So here is more clear if I plot uh, just the, the RMSD of the head. And this is the, the nutty state of this uh, GD1 with this salt bridge uh, stabilized between 47 and 50. And here, boom, the RMSD from this state is just going high. And uh, that's because the, the, the loop is going in this misfolded configuration. So you can see the, uh, now the 47 is here in, uh, in exposed to the solvent. And there is another salt bridge uh, with uh, 50 with 46. So this is stabilizing a little bit some of this uh, configuration. Okay? So this uh, is uh, the moment that we weren't able to control our uh, uh, simulation anymore. So we tried to, ex this is just a portion, so we tried to extend a little bit more and no refolding event anymore with this variable. So it means that something related to this transition that our collective variable are not uh, uh, able to control very well. So what we decide to do is, okay, this, this is a very local uh, uh, rearrangement in the sense that uh, if you think of our uh, coordinates, our contact map between uh, C alpha, which uh, is uh, assessing things uh, changing from 5 to 8 angstrom or something like this, 6 to 8 angstrom, these are really subtle things involving also side chain that this contact map is not controlling very well. So probably this is uh, the, the, region, the reason why we are not very good in describing this conformational change. We thought something like this. So instead of, uh, of uh, improving our contact map, we split uh, the problem in different stages. So first we take care of this transition between these two uh, type of turns, but using a more uh, um, detailed matrix than the contact map, and we use the all these atoms and then the RMSD. 
So we, we, we use the same approach with the path variables, but just on this, just acting on this uh, uh, part of the system. So we define, a, we, we add uh, an initial reaction path from the simulation just overhead, just over loop. So we say, okay, let's devise a path just in this part of the protein. The path goes from this, uh, from an opening and a misfolded configuration. And we did metadynamics in this variable. The metadynamics now is just acting on the loop of the protein. But when you act on the loop of the protein, you can enforce this transition and uh, easily uh, control the formation of the hydrogen bond in this, of the other part of the, of the protein. I explain it better. So here, uh, you force this guy to uh, to break uh, this network. There are, there are hydrogen bonds here. You, you cannot see, but it's really uh, an intricate network of hydrogen bond between side chain and the last one uh, of the back one and this salt bridge. It's really, it's really uh, a mess here. But once you can control this, uh, the refolding of this is a little bit easier, even without bias. So we can force this transition to this state, and then this final hydrogen bond in a misfolded configuration are formed without a lot of effort. So just by controlling this head, this part uh, is, uh, is forming hydrogen bond almost spontaneously. This uh, is used just to study this transition. And then we see, OK, it, it looks to us, it, it seems here that we have two different regions of, of the phase space, in one in which the helix is properly folded, the turn is properly folded, the other one in which is uh, misfolded. So we just uh, divide the problem in two parts and studied the folded turn landscape and the misfolded turn landscape. And to do this, we used, we have to move the whole body of the, of the protein and we use again the contact map, which you do you remember in the first round, the first part at fixed head was kind of good, the unfolding and refolding of all the body of the beta helping with contact map. So okay, we kept this, but now we just we just stay in at fixed folded turn, and what we found is a, a kind of perfect fun of the landscape, which means, okay, once the head is, is formed, you can easily uh, reach the native state. You just zip all, all, the, all the other hydrogen bond. And similarly, uh, when you go to the, when you fix uh, more or less, because we start from a not perfectly fixed head uh, turn, and we went to the misfolded configuration that we found, and we, we found something similar, a sort of fun and landscape that goes to this misfolded configuration. And this kind of misfolded structure are extremely uh, are present and have been found in more than one simulation. The stability depends, of course, a little bit on the force field, but it's a kind of uh, something that has been confirmed over and over by simulations. Uh, we even try to to go directly, to design a fictitious path to go directly to this state, uh, from this state to this state uh, without uh, breaking completely and passing from unfolded state by just sliding uh, uh, slowly the hydrogen bond from one state to the other because there was a uh, previous work with a cross grain potential that state, okay, there is a sort of rotation uh, mechanism that brings the native state to the mis to a misfolded state, and we try that. We design a path going from one state to the other. So this is the reputation movement at z equal to zero. We do the dynamics on this, and immediately we went far away from this path. And what we recovered is uh, something very far away, very also uh, kind of broad here. But the idea is that. Uh, uh, we didn't, we never converged this calculation very well, but the idea is that uh, this is going far away to break everything until the, uh, to, uh, to break all the back for native hydrogen bond to this area, more or less, and here you break uh, uh, completely the, the head, and here you try to reform the misfolded. It never formed and reform the misfolded completely here, but we didn't invest a lot of time on this. The idea is to see, to see if uh, there was something likely occurring here, but immediately in all our trials, the system just tried to destroy everything, unfold, 
and refold that, but in the wrong way. So this reassured us that the mechanism of this reputation was not possible. Okay, I think I will not talk about this, uh, this work, and uh, time for lunch, unless you have uh, other questions. No questions? Similar to the case method, uh, because you have a, a, a case path. Um, here the idea, I, I, I'm not an expert in string method, I think you will hear a lot about it in the next week from Eric. Uh, here the idea is uh, to use metadynamics as a, as a sampling technique, but just to be clever to uh, describe a configuration in terms of a, of a reference path. And the free energy then is calculated with respect to this variable from a normal metadynamics calculation. Yes. So there is a, uh, so if you ask about the brand value, the guy that developed it, uh, knows that there are very technical, important technical differences, which I don't, I don't know really. But there is one very big difference, and here you are using two correct variables, and one is the distance from the path, and which is not used in the methodical. So the idea is that you, you can use, uh, as Max was showing, if you have a wrong path, can find that the system is running away from that path because you are not constraining it to stay there. Okay. You can, but typically you don't and you use that as a condition of the variable. So you, you can find a better path. You can trust it in a local, yeah, exactly, in yeah. a local minimum. Yes, so over imagine in the case we have two paths which both are reasonable but they are different. You start from one and then when you push the system away from that one, okay. you can find the other one. That's I think in, in practical application to make it. Other questions? Okay, so I think it's time to go to lunch. <laughs>